My next guest is Adam Newman, the co-founder and former CEO of WeWork, once one of the most valuable and sought after private companies in 2019 when it was time to sell the business to the public market at a valuation of $47 billion, it all came crashing down. Investors rejected the company's governance structure, exploding losses and conflicts of interest. Ultimately, Newman was forced to step down from the company he co-founded in what was a dramatic exit. Books have been written about it, documentaries have been made, Apple's making a show about it, and just two weeks ago, WeWork went public on the New York Stock Exchange at a valuation of about $9 billion. Adam joins us right now in his first interview since stepping down more than two years ago. Thank you so much for being here, Adam. Andrew, thank you for having me. Uh, there's a lot to talk about. There's a lot of questions and unanswered questions. Um, there's some folks that, as you know, are angry, even to this day, and I hope that over the next half hour or more, we can talk about all of it and maybe uh, as candidly as possible, get into some of the lessons that were learned in the process. Um, I'll tell you where I want to start, though. You have been silent for the past two years. A lot of people have sought you out trying to get those answers. Why speak now? So first of all, Andrew, thank you for having me. And you were kind enough about two years ago to invite me to speak. Yep. In, in the middle of it. In the call. middle, in the midst of everything. And you gave me the opportunity, said that would be a great stage. And I have to tell you, and you know me, I actually enjoy speaking. And two years ago, when I stepped down, I took a moment just to reflect. And it was very quickly apparent that any word I would say, anything I would do is just going to attract more attention to me. And because it's always been about the company first, I made a very conscious decision not to speak. And I assumed that I'll speak when WeWork was going to be on solid ground. I didn't know it was going to take two years. Of course, no one could have anticipated Corona, which was very difficult for, for a lot of people. So I waited. Two weeks ago, WeWork went public. So we're here today. So let's talk about the past two years. And to the extent that you have been thinking a lot, I imagine, about what went wrong during this whole period, if you could do it all over again, uh, and the fact that the company has had some success now, but clearly at a very different valuation and, uh, frankly, with a lot less employees than that were there then. Yes. What's, a, what's, what's the thought? Has there been a lesson in all this for you? So I've had a lot of time to think, and there have been multiple lessons and multiple regret, regrets. But I think, and you touched on it with the employees, I think my biggest regret when an employee joins a company, they join to join a mission. They join to go in a direction, a path that's set by leadership, that in this case was set by me and the executive team. And a lot of them did it for the right reasons. When employees um, choose to go on a mission and they come with a full heart, and I think most of the employees that were with us were actually there with a full heart. And then suddenly there's a change in direction that right. they didn't control. And they lose their jobs because of something that they didn't do. I did not expect it. I didn't want it. I feel tremendous regret for it. Even though it happened after I stepped down, and it happened because the company changed directions. It was We were on a grow, grow, revenue-oriented company, and the decision was to make it profitable, and you needed a lot less employees for that. I regret for every single person that had to go through that. It was not my intention and not what they signed up for. But what, what do you say to all of the employees, and we're talking about thousands of employees, who lost their job, whose options effectively became worthless at that $47 billion valuation, who look at you and say, not only did this all happen under your watch, but you walked away with more than a billion dollars. So first of all, Andrew, I understand. I understand that that's the feeling, and I understand that that, that would be the perception. As I said, uh, I didn't speak for two years, so I haven't had the chance to say anything. If, if I can just give a little context. So there are actually three groups of employees. There are the employees who started with me, the original WeWork employees. Actually, when the IPO happened, 150 of them celebrated together with Miguel right. and I. We did a little event for it. It was very nice. Uh, they're all in the money. Anybody who came before 2015 was in the money and, and made a return on this IPO. There are the employees who are right now in WeWork who are all part of the company going public, and their success will, will take it to the next level. And I think it's important to say that the current management team has done an amazing job walking through the pandemic. That is not an easy thing, one of the biggest challenges in commercial real estate. So those employees are now getting compensated. There is a group of employees between 2016 to 2019 that came at the same time that Massa came in with the high valuations. 
that of course is, is underwater. And from a $47 billion valuation to, you said, a $9 billion when it went public, they're underwater. But I think what you're really saying is this feeling that I walked away with, with money that maybe I didn't earn or didn't deserve. We work, uh, sold $4 billion of secondary in its history until it went public. Out of that $4 billion, I, Adam, sold about $870 million. Employees were about $550 million, not including Miguel. And investors were about $2.3 billion, almost three times as much as me. All those people sold a proportionate share when it was the time to sell. It all happened, and the last time I sold, uh, the highest valuation was $17 billion, and that was in 2017. And that was almost four and a half years ago. Okay, but there's, there's two issues here. There's, there's the money that you took out then, and then there's the money that you were able to keep in this company today, which is now worth more than a billion dollars, I think. And it's those investors and employees who got in, as you said, 2015 a after that, who have nothing. So first of all, Andrew, again, I understand the perception. But if you go into the details a little bit, when you own a company as a founder, I own 30% of the company. When there are secondary events, people can sell. So those events occurred, and, right. and people had the opportunity to sell. Uh, when a company goes public, whatever equity you're left with is your equity. So every single thing I have is just the equity I had to start, and then we got diluted as, investment, as investments uh, came through. This perception that as the company went from a $47 billion valuation down to, time, to nine, that I profited somehow while the company was going down is, is completely false. I think the perception is that when the company was effectively taken over by SoftBank, somehow you were able to extract the equivalent of a billion dollars for what was a company that then some people thought would have otherwise gone bankrupt. I understand. Thank you for clarifying. Yes, that would sound very bad. That's not what happened. What really happened is, so it is the numbers around a billion. It's that 870 that I sold, plus a SoftBank paid me about 180 million as a consulting non-compete fee. So the 180 million is SoftBank's money. They paid it to get control over the company. It was a transaction. The 870, half of it was sold in these secondaries over the course of seven years. And the other half of it was just now, uh, about right. three months ago, in the standard that we did. So that perception of a billion dollars when the call went down was just a false narrative that because I wasn't speaking, we weren't able to correct. But what do you tell the employees then who came after 2015, who don't have their jobs now, and many of whom would say that they took lower salaries during that period and stock because they believed, they were believers, and that you made them believers? I would say, first of all, that I understand and I'm very disappointed for them and with them. And it was never my intention for the company not to succeed as much as it did. It was, you have to remember, at the time that they came in, the investors were behind us. Corporate America was behind us. The banks were behind us. We had enterprise, we had, uh, you had Apple here. We had Google, Facebook, and Microsoft giving us tremendous real pieces of the real estate portfolio for us to manage. Our brand, our product was liked by consumers literally globally. So we all believed when they came in and they got the pay, and, and again, saying if the pay was high or low, we would have to go into the details. I think by 2016, 2017, we, we started being uh, very good payers, but I don't know the exact details. But uh, when you take equity, Andrew, and you join a startup, you take a risk. Now, I wish it would have worked out differently for everybody, but the market now decided that it's worth $9 billion. It's getting measured on a daily basis, and I actually think we work today as a bigger opportunity than back then. Okay, but I, I still want to go backwards still to totally. try to understand what you think went wrong. And whether you thought the $47 billion valuation, which was so important to so much of what happened, was ever right. So those are two questions. I'll, I'll start with the 47. Um, Massa invested at a $47 billion valuation. And this is Massa, son of SoftBank, who, who was with us, by the way, last year at this conference and spoke about you. He, he did, he actually spoke, and thank you, Andrew, for that very nicely. He did. I thanked him afterwards for it, and it was interesting because it was in the midst of litigation, because that's when the payment didn't come in, right. and there was a big litigation. We're going to talk about that soon in a minute. It's okay, but it taught me a lesson, because even when that was happening, everything was still high level, and relationships were very good. But yes, I'm talking about Massa, the largest investor in the world, some will say one of the most successful investors in the world, a very powerful man, a very creative man. 
And when he came in at 47 billion, he believed in it. We all believed in it at, at that time. And I think you might have seen some of them. We had bankers coming to us showing us, uh, I'm embarrassed to say, but pieces of paper saying that we might be an extremely highly valued company, way more than 47 billion. So when the whole world is telling you that, yes, we believed it and, and we thought it was really happening. So that valuation was real. What happened in 2019, if you remember, the market changed. There was a moment there where Lyft and Uber were gonna go public for very high numbers, they did. And then the next day, their valuation got cut by more than 50%. The market moved from uh, revenue to profitability. And I regret actually not understanding that fast enough. And I don't think WeWork was able to make the shift fast enough, at least not under my leadership. Um, there's a scene where you and Masa are meeting. It's been written about many times now where Masa asks you in a fight who wins, the smart guy or the crazy guy. And apparently you responded, the crazy guy. And he said, you're correct. No, I said the smart guy. You said the smart yeah, guy. I thought, I thought you the smart guy. You thought the guy. smart guy. I did, what, 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 do you think? I would have thought the smart guy too. I said the smart guy and he said wrong, the crazy guy. Because no one wants to get in a fight with a crazy person. And so in retrospect, do you think the valuation was the problem? First of all, I think looking back and trying to pinpoint is it's a good game and we can play it a little bit, but it's hard to tell. So I, I, I don't really know the one thing. There were so many events that happened. But if I had to focus on a problem, I think I had a style of running the company that early on was excellent. And we were working very hard and we built this global brand and we created a world where people made a life and not just a living and it was working phenomenally. Master comes in in 2016 and we were growing fast already. And he said, Adam, grow faster. He would say, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Uh, it was a trick question, what do you think, chicken or the egg? Never know. Never know. So I said the egg because I thought, he said, no, no, the chicken. So in Master's world, you, you just grow and take over the market. And I agreed with him. And the reason I agreed with him because our unit economics, which now the current company is, is proving it, our four-wheel unit economics were profitable. So yes, you wanted to own the category. So we started growing faster and faster. And, and, my, and, and my, that same style that made us grow so fast and was such a good fit for a startup. In the end of 2018, and we might talk about this a little later, Master was gonna do this large transaction. Yep. He was gonna put $10 billion in the pockets of all the investors and $10 billion on the company's balance sheet. And we were gonna stay private longer. December 2018, December 24th, he calls me and says, Adam, I'm not doing the deal. For reasons that are to his own, it had nothing to do with WeWork. At the time I was upset, today I understand why he had to do what he had to do. And we were sort of forced to go public. And where I missed big time, that same style that worked so well until then was not the right style for Wall Street. You then add to that um, the revenue changing, the world changing from revenue to profitability, and you find yourself in a perfect storm. And I think that's one of the things that happened. What do you make of the arguments, though, around your style and the culture that that created? And when I mean culture, there were allegations of drinking and drugs and people staying up all night and doing all sorts of things and, and money just being spent in ways that probably, in retrospect, they shouldn't have been. First of all, I think those all make great stories for movies and for television shows. I think the market, use the word drugs, uh, weed, I think is what you're referring to. It's the only yep. drug I'm aware of. Uh, and I would say we had a fun culture, but first let's start with the fact. We built a global brand in over 110 cities, in over 40 countries. We were talking 60 languages, so every time you updated the website, it was in 60 different languages, and we became a household name. So that culture had a lot of things that worked really well. And did we have fun? We, we had a lot of fun, and I think that's great that we had a lot of fun. Again, it's that personal style, and you can also say it about the company. There comes a moment where you grow out of that to the next stage, and I think that could have happened sooner. But do you think, and, and I, by the way, I'm seeing, we, we're getting questions and we're going to make this as interactive as possible. One of the questions someone just asked is, does the, did the valuation, you think, affect your management, and management style? Do, do you think it made you become more arrogant in how you did it? I think that's a great question. Um, as we were doing this, and the world was telling us, you're correct, it's working. The valuation was just another way where people sort of told us that we were right. Oh, everything is working. We're headed in the right direction. The value is going up. Remember also our investors were the biggest investors in this country. Right. They weren't your 
everyday investors. They're blue chip and they're the best of the best. So yes, the valuation made us feel like we were right, which made me feel that whatever style I was leading at was a correct style at the time. So I do think it, it affected it. I also think the chase, and at some point I do think, and I think that's what maybe is, is getting hinted that maybe it went to my head. I do think at some point it did. And I think the moment you lose focus on really the core of your business and why this business was what it meant to be, and when I saw our employees two weeks ago, I was reminded, and we were such a family, and we had a real mission, and, and we meant it. But when, so you, but I'm trying to understand when you think it went wrong in that regard, when it went to your head. And, and the reason I ask is people, you know, we do read the stories about the airplane and the Maybachs and the houses and, the, and all of that. And I feel like we've now had a bunch of conversations uh, over the years, and, and I, I've never understood where that where that part of it came from. So again, I think, I think we're touching two things. You're talking about going to my head, but you're also, we're also talking about style. I think it, for a long time, most seven years out of the nine that I was there, it was working really well. Uh, you touched the plane, for example. A lot of talk has been done about the plane. Uh, again, 110 cities. I would fly every week or every two weeks to go see three to five cities a week because part of what we did is we would show up Right. And I would meet the employees, and I would meet the community managers, and I would meet the members. I would do enterprise sales. If there was a deal in China, I was going to right. China. If there was a deal in India, I was in India. One of the reasons enterprise liked us so much is because you could take office in New York, Shanghai, Beijing, and, uh, and uh, Bombay. And because you could do all these things, we, we became very attractive to those enterprise clients. So needing a plane was very needed. Did we need that plane? Could we have used VistaJets, which is a timeshare for planes? I'm sure there were other solutions, but people focus on this, and this is what I regret. People focus on that so much. They're missing the actual story because the fact that we had a plane definitely did not detract from the success. Let me ask you a different question, because it really goes back to the employees. There are stories about your assistants who apparently were told that they had to go into the plane, set it up, you know, uh, set up the Apple TVs for your kids, stay there you know, for 48 hours working on it before you were going somewhere. There were these stories about just, you would make, pe you know, people would be made to wait. Uh, people were made to work in sort of ways. And I think they all did it because they believed. And so I'm just, that's what I'm trying to get at. So you're touching a few things. I'll, I'll try to choose one of them. Let's start with the wait. I definitely had a challenge with uh, being on time. And I do, you know, I actually only have had a few conversations. I think I might have mentioned this one to you in the few conversations we had, there was a moment where we got so busy that suddenly uh, we even lost track of time. I've learned a lot since then. Respecting someone being five minutes early is 10 minutes late. I was here today an hour early, by the way. We we're sitting downstairs. And that's just basic respect. And I think it's important. And no matter what you are and who you are, that always needs to be the case. So starting with that, that was not appropriate. but. It wasn't done with a bad intention. We were really busy, and we were running so much. But again, a mistake that I will not repeat again, and some of the people I have around me today would never let me make that mistake. Specifically with the kids, you know, the moment anybody tries to bring my kids into the story, I sort of, I think that's a boundary. Because I can take it, and anything right. you want to say about me, it's OK, and we can have this very open discussion. But, uh, but my kids, it's, it's sort of where I draw the line. And uh, whatever it is that happened or didn't happen on a plane, when, when someone flies on these kind of planes and they have kids, yes, people set up Apple TVs for them. I don't know the exact, uh, I don't know the exact story. Um, we have another question coming in, which is lots of people are asking this. If you feel so badly for former employees who are out of their money and out of the job, um, would you consider sharing a small portion of the wealth that you've gained from all of this? Have you thought about that? So, We've thought about that a tremendous amount. And part of our lesson is not to talk about things, but actually just do them. I think we did a lot of talking in the past 10 years. And we built a great company. But there was enough talking. So Miguel and I actually, over the past few months, have done multiple things, but not stuff that, uh, that we feel obligated to share. I have thought about that. We do a tremendous amount of give back. And there is a lot more in stored in that topic, but it's all done quietly. OK, well, we'll keep talking about that. Let me ask you this. Um, one of the things that happened in the IPO process was the S1 came out. And people started reading through it and saying, oh my, I didn't know about this. I didn't know about this. I didn't know about this. One of those things was this concept of self-dealing. 
there was an accusation that you had effectively started buying up buildings yourself personally and then leasing them back to WeWork. Was there any part of you that thought as you were doing that 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 was inappropriate? I'm happy you brought this up because I haven't had a chance to respond to that. So first of all, there's never been self-dealing in WeWork. What it's called is related party transaction. And when we did the related party transaction, not only did our board approve it and we used best practices, we tended with a general counsel who was very strict, and I'm grateful for that. And she used to send whatever it is transaction we did to our top investors and have them approve it also. Sort of do a vote on it that had to be above 50% that we weren't involved in the vote. So every single transaction we did. But the misunderstanding here is it was four buildings. We did it because we wanted to set a trend for WeWork. I thought WeWork should own buildings, but off balance sheet was a separate entity. And the way I was going to do it is we were planning to buy the first four and then hand them over to WeWork. What else was written in the S1 is that ARC, which was the name of this entity that was going to buy buildings, was going to buy these buildings for me at cost, which yep. was a loss for us. And there was never an intention except for that. I'll give you another piece of information that people don't know. We only have, we, it, we, it was only four buildings. We lost money on all of them. We still lose money on them. And the two that we work was in, we work wanted to give us back. We took them back, and we lost more money on them. This was never about losing money. But what I do understand, Andrew, because I had a lot of time to think, I understand the perception. And I understand why it could seem that way very clearly. And in the future, even though I know we didn't do anything wrong legally, I will stay away. There's no need for that. What about the trademark we? You had trademarked the word we. I was surprised we were even able to trademark the word we, because I think of that as a public domain for word or phrase to begin with, and then ultimately sold it to WeWork. And people looked and said, what is going on here? I'm, I'm repeating myself, but I'm going to have to say it again. I understand that that sounds horrible. So let's just start with that. OK, let's start with the facts. You cannot trademark the word we. This is just another part of the folklore. You're right. You cannot trademark the word we. It was not about that. Miguel and I, when we started the company, we had we everything. We bank, we live. There were a lot of different we's in the mix. And when WeWork started and benchmark investment, it was just about WeWork. So there was intellectual property we were holding. Before, it was not actually we, because that's the one thing I was never able to trademark, even though the company's ticker now is we. So that's interesting. But um, when that occurred, uh, right before we went public, Miguel and I were sitting in a room, and the lawyer said, guys, you have to hand over all your intellectual property. Right. I said, of course, it, we, it was our intention. He said, yeah, but you have to take a payment for it. And we said, why do we have to take it? We don't want a payment for it. You can't, because you're going public, and it wouldn't be an above-board transaction. I don't exactly know what that means, but that was what was told to us. It means it has to be, that's the legal way of doing it. We asked three more times, but you can imagine at the time there was a lot going on and the S1 was happening and yep. things weren't going as well as we wanted to already at that moment. And we said, okay, and the, it was six million in stock, two we holdings, which is an entity Miguel and I own. The next day, and we disclosed it in the S1. This was not something we were trying to hide or anything. This is what we told was the minimum amount for that IP. And we were gonna donate so much anyway, we, we didn't even think about it twice. Uh, the next day, the S1 went and that explosion occurred. And we went back into the same room and said, guys, we told you we didn't want to do this. There must be something. And then someone raised his hand in the back and said, well, if you gift it and pay the gift tax to the company, then uh, to the IRS, then you can give it for free, which we did the next day. So that was not our intention. If I went back and I could change time and avoid that mistake and gift it on the second, I would. OK, a lot of people have asked about what was then called something called community adjusted EBITDA. People thought that was a sort of made-up metric. So we had a financial team that was very experienced. We had a CFO that took companies public three times. An idea came from that side of the table of community adjusted EBITDA because we were so creative in branding. We were branding everything. We had community managers, not building managers. It was all about we. It was all part of how we work. It was part of the culture. When I heard that, I didn't think that was a problem. Looking back at it, when it comes to financial metrics, let's use the right ones. But I want to make one thing clear. Community adjusted EBITDA was a different way of saying adjusted EBITDA, or more accurately, four wall profitability. So if we just use the term that was used, so the term was not a, in any way a bad term. But when you deal with financial terms, you should just stick another lesson. Stick to the original terms. When it comes to finance, it's better to be boring. There was a moment when Jamie Dimon is said to have sat down with you and said, 
you're going to have to walk away from this. Do you remember that conversation? Hard to forget. What happened? Um, I never really got to speak about this. You know, it's interesting. The stories came as half stories, so they're all only half there. It was a Sunday, and uh, Jamie called me into his office, and we were discussing, and we had a very nice relationship, one that I hope uh, we will in the future again. And he told me, Adam, you've done a great job until now, but you're going to have to put the company first. And I said, Jamie, I'm always ready to put the company first. And he said, I, I, I think you should step down. I'm telling you to step down, suggesting, I think. And I said, why? He said, with you there, you won't be able to raise the money. Without you there, we'll help you raise the money. We'll make it all happen. The company will be saved. And in the future, things will work out well. And uh, I trusted Jamie. And I looked up to Jamie. I still do. And I listened to him. And three days later, I stepped down. What's your relationship with him now? So actually, Jamie specifically, I haven't had the chance to be as connected with. But JP Morgan, we have a great relationship. We do a lot of our banking with them. And Mary Erdos, who is his number right. two, I get to speak to. Um, there's what now has turned out to be an iconic picture of you walking on the street, I believe uh, right near Gramercy. I know you like NFTs, good NFT. That's uh, with your phone. And you're not wearing shoes, no socks either on the street. I think about a day or two after you had stepped down. Do you remember that? Do you remember what was happening then in your so, mind? So, you know, I think maybe you know this about, I grew up in a kibbutz, which is a version of like a social environment in Israel. I didn't wear shoes from when I was maybe six till, till the army, probably. So for me, not wearing shoes was, was not a big deal. That's how I used to walk around. I do remember what was going in my mind. At that moment, it was that week, not just that moment, it was when we stepped down, I wasn't speaking, everyone was blaming us, it was tremendous pressure. Two things happened. One, company first. I knew that even though I had so much to say and I wanted to explain so many things, anything I do was gonna attract more attention to me and was gonna be a distraction. And I had to make sure this company was gonna get to where it is. And again, this is why going public two weeks ago is, is personally for me, so professionally fulfilling. And, and then the other one was that morning, something Rebecca told me, which was, I, I, I was very stressed. And, and she looked at me and she goes, we're all good. You have me, you have the kids. We'll go to live in my mother's house. Because she says she has no mortgage. We'll go live at my mother's house. And I looked at her and I realized that everything was good. I was horrified by everything that was happening. But I also had this feeling of calmness of, it will work out, it's gonna be very painful, I'm gonna learn a lot from this, but if I can take the lessons, one day I'll look back at it and, and there'll be value in it. I know there are people who are gonna be watching this and who are gonna say you were good, in part because you had a lot of money to walk away with. One of the questions I was gonna ask you is how you negotiated with SoftBank to keep that money. So two, two thoughts there, one, at that moment, I didn't. At that moment, and I think it's been published also, I had a debt with JP Morgan. Right. At that moment, I had 13 days to pay way more money than I ever had access to um, back then. And I didn't know where it was gonna come from. So when she told me that, she said we're all good because she thought bankruptcy was what was gonna happen and we were still all good. So it's just a little correction there. Then when SoftBank came in and as part of that settlement, they closed that debt and funded the company, and um, that, um, that changed. So if you want me also to tell you how that negotiation went, I'm, I'm happy to answer. Tell us. Well, it's interesting. Something else that's been said about me was that when I negotiated, I negotiated a little bit too heavy handed. And sometimes I wouldn't live enough on the table for the other side. And it's another lesson that I learned. If you walk out of the negotiation table without both sides feeling like they gave a little bit too much and both sides being slightly unhappy, then you took too much. And again, lesson learned and will be applied, has been applied in the future. We were just starting our family office. The person who was running it with me, his name is Elon Stern. He's an outstanding individual. And we're about to walk into this negotiation with SoftBank. And he told me, Adam, I joined you because I thought you were one of the best negotiators in the world, a visionary, and I was excited to run your family office. What you're gonna need to do now is negotiate with no uh, leverage. That's the hardest thing someone can do. 
But he said, but I think you can do it because it's your truth. It comes from the heart. And both Masa and you know that this company one day is going to be worth a lot of money because you're a category killer. It's the second largest asset class. One day people will forget and this company will be public. And one day it will grow. And I walked in there and it was with Marcelo. And he was very gracious with me. This is Marcelo Claré from SoftBank. Who I think you also yep. interviewed yep. just not too long ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was very gracious with me. And he basically said, Adam, here's the parameter. Here's what we need, and here's what you need. And I tried to take Elon's advice, and with no leverage, just with what was fair and not fair, ensured what I thought were the two most important things. We work had to be funded. And remember back then, that's before Corona. I didn't know that we're about to go into one of the worst downturns in commercial real estate, right? Commercial real estate right. co-working in the time of Corona is not the world's best idea. Um, flexible office and community in a world post-corona when work has shifted might turn out to be one of the best ideas. So this was before. So, Masa fun, so Marcelo said, we'll fund the company, which ended up, I think, being what saved the company throughout this whole thing. And the second thing was just to take care of our own personal uh, situation that was so extreme. And then they also wanted the control. And it's been said a lot that I had full control of the company with the true. This is something Marcelo said, and I really believe in it and in him. He told me, Adam, Massa trusted you and gave you all this money. Now it's your turn to trust Massa and trust me and give us back the control. And he said it. I agreed with him. We shook hands. It was a very short negotiation. One of the things you negotiated for, though, I understand, is to be a board observer potentially starting next year in the future of this company. So. The two different negotiations. The, back then, we negotiated. So I was chairman of the board. Right. I went from chairman of the board to very quickly. I went from CEO, chairman of the board, to board observer, which was a humbling experience. And as a board observer, you sit and observe, which was very good for me. And I actually I spent a year not saying one word. I waited till I was being asked, and after a year, I was asked the first time. It was it was interesting and a good lesson for me. But uh, but that was back then. When we closed all of this, um, when I completely stepped off and we signed the MTA, I actually gave up my, this was uh, about a year ago, I actually gave up my board observer seat. When we did this litigation as part of the settlement, I had the right to ask to be a board observer again. And I think they need to seriously consider it uh, in a year from when the company goes public. But just, you know, Andrew, I have no intention right now of asking for anything. I'm very proud of the team. I'm happy with what everyone's doing. And I'm enjoying taking the back seat on this topic and focusing on other things that we're doing today. I want to talk about some of those other things in just a moment. But let me ask you this. What's the relationship now with Masa? You ultimately sued Masa. So sometimes, no soft question today, huh? <laughs> Only the tough ones. Sometimes in big relationships, when huge dollar signs are part of it. Litigation comes at the end. I actually think what we can learn from Masa, even in, so Masa was supposed to pay in, a, the, the deal was beginning November 1st, so I right. stepped down October, suppose, without getting into the details, was supposed to buy. Everyone thought it was a golden parachute. It wasn't. He was buying from all shareholders $3 billion worth of stock. I happened to have owned 30%, so I was a billion out of the three. Remember, he never got paid. That's the confusion everyone has because he never, he didn't pay it back then. He only paid it three months ago and 50% and of it. But we negotiated this deal and Masa was supposed to pay April 1st. Corona hit, and again, we're saying it, and I think yep. people have gotten used to saying Corona. It's been a very difficult two years for the world. And, and I know a lot of people, I'm sure you have, I, I know a lot of people who've been affected very personally. So it's been a difficult time. And Corona happened, and SoftBank was supposed to pay April 1st, and they didn't, even though the contract said. So that $3 billion, those employees you're talking about, that was the one thing that was still going for everybody there. And they were going to be $300 million out of that $3 billion. So a real amount of money. Um, and it didn't pay. So we were left with no options. So actually, the board uh, sued Massa, because the special committee sued SoftBank, because they were representing the investors. And then we had our own relationships in the MTA. We sued also. And we ended up actually, so that's what happened. Mm -hmm. What's interesting about it, come October of, uh, of, 20, of, of 2020, as this whole thing is, star is, is starting to come together, I saw that this litigation wasn't going anywhere. And I realized that unless we can find a win-win-win situation for Massa, for the investors, for the employees, and for us, this thing is going to go all the way to court, which is the last thing we work needed. 
and I asked one of my other family office members, could we SPAC WeWork? Because this is when all the SPACs were happening in this. And he said to me, of course, I've been telling you, his name is DJ, I've been telling you about this for three months. We called UBS, we said, guys, we want to SPAC WeWork, obviously not us, but someone should, can we help? And they said, you can, there's a guy called Vivek, he has a SPAC out there, he's the right guy for this. Maybe if you talk to him and just tell him what your vision is, he'll go and do the rest on his own. We called Vivek, I had three conversations with him, he's unbelievable, I told him what I would do differently, I told him my mistakes, and I told him why I believe in WeWork in a post-corona world. I moved away after that, he came to the company and eventually sparked the company at nine billion, and the SPAC and the litigation sort of happened at the same time and one was connected to the other. So by settling one, you're able to do the other, company went public, we again practiced this no leverage right. uh, negotiating, and uh, I think we're better for it today. How do you feel about this? Because I remember a couple of weeks ago when, when the company went public, I had asked the company about your role, which had been cited in one of the SEC filings, and there was a sense that they did not want you to be able to take credit for what had happened. Not just building the company, which of course you get credit for, but for putting this deal together. So I, I wasn't aware of that because you never shared that with me. Again, I understand, and I understand that everyone needs, there's a playbook that I wasn't so familiar with that happens when these things occur. Um, you know, for me, it's just about the truth. What I just said is Vivek would be the right person to ask. Sandeep knows about this also, but I don't want to take too much credit for it. The only thing I did is call him and say, well, I think it's a great thing. What they should take credit for, and they deserve all of it, they led this company through this uh, pandemic, which is so difficult. They took the company public. I heard Sandeep say publicly that next quarter, the company's going to be profitable. All the words that have ever been said about WeWork being a house of cards, or WeWork being all, all those words that are used about WeWork sometimes. They're not true. WeWork didn't crash. It, uh, the valuation went down by 80%, but it's doing great, and I actually have a feeling that it has a bright future ahead of it. Do you think that SoftBank will ever make its money back? I'm sh You were getting me excited. I strongly feel that there's a very high likelihood that SoftBank's gonna make their money back. I happen to know around what share price it is, and when this company went public, it was getting close there. Yes, I'm sure when you're in the second largest asset class on the planet and uh, your brand, household name, not a person, right. I think, in business at least, that doesn't know the name we work, good or bad, they all know the name. And in a world of post-pandemic where hybrid working, I'm sure you, we're sitting right yep. now in a yep. studio when you used to be in a huge yep. stadium and hopefully in the future you will be. Uh, I think we work as position to win and take huge market share of commercial office space. Okay, I want to talk about your future in one sec, but there was a relatively difficult question that's been asked now multiple times here, um, which is, there's a view, and I'm curious what you think of the comparison. There are people who compare you um, to Theranos, to Elizabeth Holmes, to this idea that there was this sort of fake it till you make it kind of approach. What do you think of that? So again, when you talk about me, I can take it. And when I'm ready, I will answer the things that need to be answered or not. When you refer to WeWork as a fraudulent company or compare it to companies that don't exist today and are actually being, and again, I don't want to make any assumptions on things I don't know, but to companies that are not around and, and are actually being uh, dealt with in a very specific way, forget me, you're offending the employees that built this company. You're offending the management team today that's running it. You're offending Marcelo. You're offending Vivek. You're offending Barry Sterling, who led the pipe. We work as a public company. It's in the billions. It's, it has a ticker that's we, which we like. And it's positioned to be, to be a real winner. And if you're going to say that it's a house of cards or it's fraud, you're, it's just false. You actually uh, had your lawyers go to HBO which had you in a documentary, uh, and had them take out certain words where they were comparing you to these things. So regretfully, um, when we tried, so as we said, I didn't speak. Then we tried a little bit to make some corrections. No one cared. And it's a shame, but we live in a world today, and maybe you're more familiar with it than me, that sometimes, unless you're ready to be slightly more aggressive, which people who don't have access to funds actually couldn't be, no one listens. So the only place where we draw the line is if you're gonna say fraud, or you're gonna say anything that's not real, and you're, not, and you're gonna lie if it's not the truth, 
Um, in the case of HBO, yeah, we asked them, but I actually think we should congratulate HBO. They, it, it wasn't this horrible thing. We told them, we explained to them. They believed the false narrative also. And once they understood what it is, they were very gracious and they actually did, did what we asked and I appreciate that. And I hope in the future more people will be willing to just put the truth out. Let's talk for a moment about the future of Adam Newman. What are you doing? Well, we've mentioned the family office a few times. So two years ago when this whole thing was happening was right when we were starting a family office. And it didn't start the way we wanted because it was a big. But actually sometimes when times are difficult, you create the best connections. And we put together a world-class world -class team and we invest in early and late stage venture, we invest in private equity, we invest in liquid markets. We've started a few companies and over the past half a year we've gotten pretty excited about crypto. Crypto? Crypto. What, we just heard from Tim Cook who's excited about crypto too. What are you buying? I heard he personally owns it but not ready to take it. You know you said the name Tim Cook, I'm just gonna say one thing, just lessons. And I know we're talking about the future already but I had a chance to have a meeting with him two and a half years ago. And in that meeting, one of the biggest CEOs on the planet, 75, 90 minute meeting, very long. I spoke so much instead of listening. I was, it made no sense. I had the chance to sit in front of a great person like that and learn, and I was busy talking. And again, that's it. it was where I was at the time. I was not in the right place in that sense. And if I do, I actually hoped he was gonna be here today. I didn't know I was gonna, I was gonna apologize to him and tell him that if I ever get a chance to speak to him again, I will listen and I apologize for being an idiot back then. So that's about him. Um, crypto. So crypto. One of the nice things to have a family office, to have a single source of capital, you can attack a problem from multiple sides. So the way we went into crypto, first we started by investing. So we chose three companies that we thought were really interesting and we invested in three that do different things in the crypto world. Once we learned from that and we started supporting those companies and helped as much as we can, we started looking at different things, specifically at DeFi. And about a month ago, we found a protocol called Klima. And Klima is a fork off of Olympus. And without getting too technical, when people in crypto use the word fork, and I'm just learning all of this myself, when people in crypto use the word fork, what they mean is a group of, of engineers got together and, and wrote a certain protocol. And then you can come and copy that, take that, and build it in a different direction, which is amazing because it's all open source and it allows people to be very creative. And Klima is a protocol that uh, takes carbon credits and retires them, actually puts them on the chain. Why is that important? Carbon credits and the environment is a huge topic, as, as we know. If you can retire carbon credits, what should happen, because there's less supply, the price of carbon goes up. When the price of carbon goes up, two amazing things happen. One. If you're a farmer and you own a forest, you don't, now you have two choices. When people want to sell a forest, usually it's to cattle herders. Cattle herders. So if you want right. meat, you gotta cut a lot of forest down. Just a number for you, Andrew, today 21 million, sorry, 21 football fields of intact forest, that's forest older than 10 million years old, intact forest, get cut every minute. And when I just started looking at this, it was nine every minute. So it's happening fast and they're selling it to these cattle ranchers. If the price of carbon goes high enough, it's worth for them to actually conserve the forest and sell these carbon credits to corporations. Same thing for corporations. Corporations now are all saying, we're gonna go and become net zero. Or we're gonna lower our carbon right. emissions. The way you do it is by buying carbon credits. The more expensive carbon credit is gonna be, the more corporations are gonna be incentivized to either lower their output or find other ways they're gonna be smarter about it. So Klima is an example of how a group of very creative individuals gets together, creates a protocol that both can make money and do great things for the environment at the same time. That falls under DeFi and it's just exciting times. Have you? Sorry how, if that was too technical. No, no. How easy ha or hard has it been for you to do business with other people? I mean, are there people when you go to them, they say Adam Newman's on the phone, I, I want to take that call or they say Adam Newman's on the phone, I don't want to take that call. So you know, early on, I was wondering that myself. I think because I'm very comfortable talking about the lessons, I'm very comfortable sharing what it is that worked and didn't work. Entrepreneurs have, are coming faster than ever before. The meetings start with me saying anything you want to ask. They go straight in, just like you did today. And I share the lessons, I tell them what I think I did right, what I think I did wrong. 
and I give them the advice that I can. But then very quickly they will say, well, how did you build a brand? And how was it so big? And how do you raise money? And we get into all these things. And I actually find with entrepreneurs, and it's one of my favorite things to do today, I learn so much from them. And the ones that come that are open to learn from my lessons and from my regrets, take it in so fast. And, and they can go out and build these great things. So uh, our pipeline has never been actually larger. And we're limited with how many people we can meet. Do you read about yourself? I don't. You don't? I don't, so no. you, you haven't read the books or the documentaries? I, I didn't, but some of my best uh, employees and colleagues from WeWork now work with me, either on new businesses we're starting or in the family office. And when they read things that are really, they think is outrageous, they show me. So I sort of have an understanding of what's out there. Uh, we got to wrap up. Jared Leto is going to be playing you in a TV drama. Do you know this? He's putting prosthetics on to really look like me. Are you going to watch it? Uh, he told me not to. He told you not to. He suggested not to, yes. So you spent time with him? Just one time. And he told you not to watch it? I was a little disappointed. When someone tells you I'm going to act you and you shouldn't watch it. But you know, you're touching sort of a different point. What happened in the world that we can take a person, look exactly like them, put on prosthetics, put their wife and kids in a show, and then do a show on a narrative that is, as we just shared some of it, because we've never spoken, we've never said the different side. On a single side, the narrative that I'm telling you is not factually true, a lot of the things. And actually do a show about that and profit money from it. I think back in the day, you were not allowed to do this. And I know public figures you can do, but if you use their face, use their name, and tell a false story, I, I wish we were able to create entertainment that was different. There's a lot of people who've been watching this. Um, if there was one thing you want them to know, it is what? That in life, sometimes you're up and sometimes you're down. But if when the times come that you're down, you understand that it's a moment in time. But if you can actually think about it and you can learn a lesson from it, and you can apply that lesson, it will become a great part of your journey. It will become a good thing, not a tragedy. And when they feel down, when, and everyone, I know around the world right now, there are a lot of people that are feeling down. And I just want you to know, I swear to you, and I know it sounds yes, and you said we took all the money. I understand everything, and I'm not the same. There was a moment where we thought it was all gone. And when Rebecca looked into my eyes and told me, we're OK. If you can have your loved ones and your family and your friends, things will work out in the future. Take it all as a lesson, enjoy the journey, and be present. Adam Newman, thank you so very much for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you, Andrew. Very, very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And thank all of you for uh, your questions and for sticking with us. We've got a huge day ahead. Meghan Markle will be with us at 2 p.m. with Melody Hobson. We'll see you then.